Hello, welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, Parent Support, uh, brought to you by the Office of Youth and Young Adult Ministry from the Diocese of Sacramento. I'm Deacon Kevin Stasco, the Director of the Office of Youth and Young Adult Ministry, and I'm glad you can join us. Uh, we have a speaker tonight uh, who has never had a cup of coffee. I, I don't really believe it, but he claims to never have a cup of coffee. That means he's never given a dime to support Starbucks either. Well, maybe he's had he's had some other drinks there. But anyway, I, I want to introduce our uh, speaker tonight, uh, J uh, Jeff Hoban. And Jeff is the executive director of Camp Gray. Um, he's a graduate of, of Xavier University with a degree in organizational communication. Jeff enjoys kayaking building wooden boats, working with fiberglass, backpacking, and cross-country skiing. He worked at Camp Gray as part of the servant leadership training team in 2003-2004, and once volunteered with the Missionaries of Charity in Kathmandu, Nepal. Jeff oversees all of the camp's operation and loves spending time with his wife, all of the, uh, Rebecca and their three kids. Uh, we will be live, we are live streaming, it says here, uh, today, tonight, uh, and Tonight we're discussing uh, fostering a love for God's creation and the beauty that surrounds us in nature uh, with youth and young adult children. Uh, this has been uh, such an interesting summer. Uh, many of us have not been able to be inside uh, except inside our own homes, uh, not being able to do inside activities. So a great summer to try a bunch of outdoor activities. Um, so, um, you know, our, um, our Pope Francis has been uh, calling upon us to, um, to, uh, to respect uh, God's creation in a different way, um, in a more respectful way, and to understand that. And uh, it's really part of our Catholic spirituality um, and a part of our Catholic spirituality that sometimes we never hear about. So hopefully Jeff will talk a little bit about that and, and, uh, and, and give us some, uh, some real, real insight into how to bring uh, you know, a real experience of God uh, through nature, uh, through outdoor education programs, through Catholic camping, which uh, we, you know, we have a Catholic camp as well, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, but uh, we really appreciate you being with us, Jeff, tonight and uh, sharing your wisdom with us. And I think you're going to start us in prayer. Thank you for being here. Awesome. You bet. Thanks so much, Deacon. And I can honestly say this is a first for me. I've never... Uh... Uh, given a talk to an audience in, a, in another time zone. So this is fun tonight. So um, I'm here in, uh, talking to you in Wisconsin tonight. So 10 o'clock my time here. Uh, but we will start. Um, I've got a little, it's called crea Creation Meditation. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a Monday. Uh, maybe it was, maybe you had one of those Mondays today. So it just encourage us to just take a moment to um, just to pause and maybe Maybe just think about a moment uh, that you've had outside. Think about just some uh, wonderful place outside um, and just kind of pause for a moment. And um, we'll use this meditation as our prayer. We'll begin in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My children, do you remember what it was like to live on the day of the first snow? As you consider the intricacy of a snowflake, as you breathe in the chilled air through your nose and mouth, and feel refreshment, I am there. As delicate clusters of flakes caress your face, it is me, your father and creator, telling you that I love you. As unique as every one of my children are the ways you see and experience me. That is why when I created the world, I created light. I knew that some of my children would love to bask in the sun's light and the sun's energy would grow your food and give you health. And that is why, as I created the world, I created the sky. I knew that some of my children would experience my wonder and majesty in contemplating the heavens. And that is why I separated the water from the dry land. As I dreamed of the great joy my children would find splashing in the waves, my heart was also filled with joy. I knew that others of my children would be enthralled with the great diversity of the soils and the land. This thought filled my heart with happiness. And that is why I created all of the living vegetation. Some of my children would glory in the vastness of plants. Others would explore and examine the most intricate details. Still others would taste, touch, and smell the plants and combine them to create savory meals to celebrate my love for them. I too celebrate the plants. And that is why I created the animals of the sea, the land, and the air. 
I love them into being just as I love you, to fill the waters in the land, to grow and play, and to each take its important role in the web of life. I knew that you, my children, would be fascinated with the animals, some of which would come to live with you, and some of which would run wild. My child, did you know that all of these creations were made for you, for your wonder and amazement? And my child, you also were made for they, as guardian and watchkeeper. My children, live in my glory with all of creation. So tonight, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gift of your creation. We ask that you just um, fill our hearts in these next few moments with a deeper sense of uh, respect and just help us open our eyes, Lord, to the beauty of all that you've given us and fill our hearts with gratitude. We ask all this in your name. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was uh, just this past weekend, actually, that um, we had some plans that fell through and uh, my kids were kind of disappointed. So I, I said to my wife, Rebecca, I said, Rebecca, we've got to do something. And um, unfortunately, my oldest son, who is 11, Andrew was sick, uh, but I took my twins and we went camping for the night. And uh, we, we just went for Friday to Saturday. We drove up to uh, the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest. And um, we were swimming in this beautiful lake, Boulder Lake, on the second day. And Mary, um, my nine-year-old daughter, said to me, she said, you know what, Dad? She said, you know, the greatest thing about the last two days is I haven't thought about COVID at all. And I think that, um, you know, that's, that's something that, that time outside does for us. It just takes us literally to another place, uh, but it just changes our mindset. It changes our frame of thinking, and it just gives us fresh eyes and, and, a, and, a, and a, just breathe in the, that air, um, just literally change the air we breathe in. And to just get outside. And so I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about um, why it's important to be outside. Really, uh, like Deacon Kevin said, what our church says about creation. And, um, and then really uh, just some practical ideas for you on uh, ways to get your kids involved with being outside. I think for me, um, it began at an early age. Um, I grew up, I was born in Minnesota, uh, but I grew up most of my life on the Pacific Northwest, just south of Seattle. And I uh, had a wonderful scouting career there. I'm an Eagle Scout. Um, and then um, I actually, after scouting, I, I did six years of, of search and rescue. So I spent a lot of time um, out in creation, out in the mountains. And oftentimes I spent my time out there um, looking for others who had gone out um, to, to be outside. Um, and they either ended found themselves injured or, or didn't find themselves, they found themselves lost um, somewhere. And so I had some pretty, awesome experiences with nature in, in that and, and really learned in those moments um, a great appreciation, a great respect for the awesomeness of, of God's creation. Um, I think, you know, uh, one mission that comes to mind uh, was a pretty, pretty big deal for me. Uh, it was Christmas Day, 1996, and I spent all day long um, recovering the bodies of two 18-year-olds who died in an avalanche. Um, and that was how, you know, they had gotten outside. They, they, they wanted to be out in nature and, um, and it obviously ended tragically. But for me, uh, it gave me this, this idea that, that we're not in charge and, you know, we're really not in charge of any aspect of our lives. And it, it gives me that, that, that sense that I need to surrender my life to God. And that's what time in nature does for me. And I think that um, that gift of surrender is a beautiful thing um, when we look at what time in nature does for us. So <clears throat> Pope Benedict said, our e earth speaks to us and we must listen if we want to survive. So, you know, you ask yourself, what, what, is, what is the earth saying to me? What, 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 what am I hearing? And we're not going to hear that voice if we're not outside and we're not uh, trying to get in touch with, with the creator. Um, bishop Hine, our bishop here in Madison, Diocese of Madison, uh, was just out of camp this weekend, and I love that he talks about nature as, uh, he said, nature is sane. Uh, when we look around the world right now and kind of all the, the insanity of human nature, we can look at 
at the gift of nature and creation and say, um, you know, everything is in its right place. And that's how it was for me uh, as I watched kind of all this go down in, in early March with, um, as the coronavirus was all kind of exploding, um, I, I knew that the cranes had returned. I knew that the maple syrup, uh, the sap was starting to flow in the maple trees. And so just that, that kind of, that sanity that we can rely on in nature, I think we need that in our lives. So uh, just, yeah, can kind of just continue to talk about how nature affected me and that voice. You know, if our, our earth speaks to us, we must listen if we wanna survive. So where else have I heard that voice? Uh, and again, some pretty awesome, powerful moments for me. Uh, my, my love of the mountains led me to, um, to go to Kathmandu, Nepal, and I worked with the missionaries of charity there. And I, I lived most of my time in the, the city of Kathmandu, which is a very dirty, polluted city. Uh, but we were able to uh, do a week of trekking through the Himalayas, and we were also able to go up to the foothills of the Himalayas for a week and live in a village. And in this village, um, they lived a very sustainable life. And this is, again, a very poor village. Uh, they didn't have a lot. And so they really boiled down life to just the absolute necessities. We had this one water buffalo out back and they would gather the dung from the water buffalo and they would harness the, uh, the methane gas and that's what they used to power their cook stove. Um, and so they cooked off this gas from water buffalo dung. It's, you know, they used everything. They used everything. And so they were such good stewards and to be out in this beautiful village in the foothills of the, foothills of the Himalayas and to see uh, just this idea of simplicity. I think that's so much of what nature is, is it's just bringing us back to a very simple life. And, and really looking at our, uh, our call to stewardship and to, to love nature and to take care of uh, creation uh, is, is a beautiful thing. Um, the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops says that as faithful stewards, uh, fullness of life comes from living responsibly in God's creation. Fullness of life comes from living responsibly. So it's part of our call as Catholics to live out uh, this life, to be faithful stewards, to really take care of what God has given us as this gift uh, that we have in creation. And it's really, you know, this idea of being in creation is, is being connected uh, this idea of connectedness to creation, to what God has given us, because as we get in touch with uh, creation, we get in touch with our creator. And we say in the creed, we believe in one God, the father, the almighty or creator, excuse me, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth. So he's created everything. And the book of wisdom goes on to say that, or tells us for from the greatness and beauty of created things, comes a corresponding perception of their creator. So it's like looking at a beautiful painting and you know, seeing how this artist, you know, what technique did he use and just getting to know the artist better. And that's what we do when we're outside. We get to know the creator better. We get to know our God better. And so time outside is, is so, so important for us as, as Catholics, but just as, as people who, who need to be uh, in tune and be in touch with that. And I think, you know, when you look at the forest, if you go out and take a walk in the woods, let's say, it's, it is, I, I say simplicity, but there's a lot of complex things going on. Um, but it, it's sort of like how life is for us. You go out in the woods and you might just say, okay, there's a tree and there's some plants, but there's so many other things going on. And I think that's uh, kind of a, speaks to God's presence in our life too, that, you know, he's got so many things going on in our life and we're just not aware of them. We just don't see uh, sometimes. So I think that going out of the forest helps us to kind of look at that analogy of, wow, what else is happening in this world that I'm not aware of in this forest right now? And what else is happening in my life that I'm also just not seeing? What is God doing? And, um, you know, you can see this, this ecology, how it all works together in his creation and how it all works together in our life too. So I think there's a lot of parallels for us. I think it's important to spend some time drawing that um, those parallels, but we're all not gonna, we're not going to be able to do it unless we just kind of get rid of the stuff of our lives, put those distractions behind us. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, if you're trying to head somewhere and you lose your car keys, 
you realize that your car keys are a pretty integral part of uh, you know, that trip. You need your car keys to start your car. And so you, you know that you're missing something. I think for us, sometimes the challenge is that we, we don't necessarily know the benefits of being outside. So we, don't, we can't recognize that we're missing it. Uh, so nature is a little different that way. And we just don't recognize that value of what we get from being outside. So it's not like that immediate need of missing your car keys. It's a little bit more subtle, but I think these benefits are uh, so great that we can't afford to, uh, to not take advantage of them, to not embrace that. We talk a lot about at camp about finding awe and wonder in God's creation. Um, and G.K. Chesterton in the early 1900s, this is way back in 1900s early, he says, contemporary society has become dry, not for a lack of wonders, but for lack of wonder. So it's really our job that there's so many things to wonder about, and there's so many things that are full of wonder or wonderful, um, but we just don't take the time. We don't take the time to get to know them. And when I talk about wonder, I like to use the definition that uh, wonder is coming to know something that we already know. So we get outside and we, we can look, like I said, we can look in that forest, but we can come to know it in a deeper and a, and a closer way. And there's a beauty in that. What else do we find in nature? We find silence. Silence, what a gift, the gift of silence. Mother, um, excuse me, Mother Teresa um, says this about silence. We need to find God and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is a friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass grow in silence. See the stars, the moons, and the sun, how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls, she says. So this idea of silence in our lives, how many of us have so much noise, but we know we know for a fact that we can get out into nature and we can find silence and, and we need it. And, and our, our, our church fathers tell us that we need silence because that's where we can find God. I think of a story of a girl that came here to camp. She came from inner city, Chicago. It's one of my favorite groups that comes because uh, they are just so blown away by what they see here and experience here because it's so vastly different from their world of inner city, Chicago. And she was in tears one day and I said, what's wrong? And she said, it's just too quiet. So it was just that idea that this silence was just overwhelming to her. She had never experienced that before. Um, and certainly for having never experienced it, it could be something fearful, but I think we all deep down yearn for some silence um, to, to really kind of get in touch with, with what God is doing in our lives. And that's what we can do out in nature. As I look at our church too, um, and you look at the Eucharist, this beautiful sacrament that we have. Um, and it, the sacrament consists of bread and wine. It doesn't consist of wheat and grapes. Um, it's, you know, it says, with which earth has given and human hands have made. So there's this beautiful cooperation between God and between his grace and our labor uh, in the work of salvation. So I, I love that to think about the Eucharist and think about this gift that we've been given. Um, Eucharist, of course, meaning to give thanks. And so this idea of gratitude for all that God has given us, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And we're really called to work in harmony with what God has given us uh, to, to bring that about and to, to receive that, the gift of his grace. Um, I think, as uh, Deacon Kevin said, you know, um, Pope Francis has spoken a lot about this and uh, and he has an encyclical. I encourage you to check it out. It's Laudato Si, which praise to you, uh, praise be to you. And he talks a lot about um, our call to be good stewards of creation. Um, he says many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. But again, we're not going to be able to change. We're not going to be able to uh, recognize the gift of creation if we're not out in it. So what does that look like? And on a practical level, uh, for, well, I'll, I'll talk firstly from, for my family, what does it look like on a practical level? Um, you know, it can be something simple. So I've talked about, I've talked about the Himalayas. I've talked about, you know, these, these big experiences out in, in the mountains, the Cascade Mountains. But 
you know, it could be something as simple. I know some of you are still working from home. It could be something as simple as just making your lunch and then going sitting on sitting on the back deck to eat the lunch, your lunch instead of staying inside. I think just getting outside anywhere uh, so you can hear the birds and you can smell the flowers and, and all those things. It can be small things. It can be just a picnic picnic at the local park. It could be a day hike, it could be some disc golf out at the local disc golf course, uh, maybe some stand up paddle boarding. Um, for your kids, certainly sending your kids to camp. There's my plug for all of you. Uh, I hope you're all camp families and are already doing that, but giving your kids that week long immersion uh, into nature, into creation is a beautiful gift uh, that you can give them so that they can begin to appreciate um, to appreciate all that God has given us. And that's really what, that's the beautiful thing about camp, especially camp uh, in a Catholic setting. Uh, so we can tie the two together so well because there's such a, an important connection between our faith and, and our time outside. Um, and, and maybe it's not something you do every day. Maybe you make a tradition that's a yearly tradition. For my family, again, here living in Wisconsin, this won't work quite as well in, in California, but uh, every year, uh, right around just after Valentine's Day in late February, uh, we tap our, our maple trees. We tap about 40 trees and we make maple syrup. We make about eight gallons of maple syrup a year. And it's a beautiful time for us to be outside because the snow is too junky to ski on at this point. And it's, uh, it's, it's too slushy to do anything else. So it's a great time to go out and you know take this gift that comes right from the tree and turn it into this beautiful uh, maple syrup that we'll enjoy. Uh, for the rest of the year. So uh, it could be something like that where you you kind of time it with the seasons. Uh, maybe it's, I don't know if you have morel mushrooms out there either, but maybe it's something uh, that comes, or maybe it's just berry picking. But you know, each year maybe you, you go to do some berry picking as a family. Um, some other things that we do in our family, we have what we call No TV Tuesday. And there's, there's this inertia problem, right? Objects at rest tend to stay at rest. But I think by just stating, and that could be you know, across the board, no technology Tuesday. Uh, but to state that, and I know that sounds crazy to, to say no technology, uh, but to the best of your ability, but that forces you into doing something else. And hopefully that will involve getting outside. And so we have the same same issue in my family. It's it's hard sometimes to, to, to make that move and to get outside. But once you do, you know you're going to have a good time. So I think that's something as well. And I think it's important for us as parents to teach our kids that beauty and to just he let them hear us recognizing beauty. So especially um, the gift of a beautiful sunset and, you know, wow, look at this beautiful gift that God has given us. And just to use those words and to, to say that, and you'll start to hear that your kids uh, will start to recognize those things too. Just tonight we were out for a bike ride and we saw uh, two sandhill cranes with two baby cranes. And it was my kids who stopped and said, wow, dad, look at the beautiful cranes. And I think they will start to notice, notice it if we are actively noticing it and, and calling it to their attention and pointing it out. So that's something that I think we um, as parents have to do as well. It's just really kind of naming those things, naming that beauty that we find um, in, in all of life. And especially, of course, outside, we just have to uh, teach our kids to appreciate beauty. And that's certainly what, what time outside can do. Um, it, it's, a, it's such a gift and, and we have to see it as a gift. We have to approach it with gratitude. Um, so those are a few practical things that, that we do. Uh, of course, as a camp director, I am blessed to live on 225 acres. I recognize that that's not everyone's life. Um, so, so please know that I, I know that that is different for all of us. And so to, for each of us, it does require a, a varying degrees of um, effort to get outside. But like I said, it can just be eating lunch outside, eating dinner outside as a family. Uh, that's a great thing to do as well. So and spending time outside, and I think the more you do it, um, the more, I think the more your heart kind of yearns for it and you recognize that it's something good for your soul. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Deacon Kevin and uh, see where we go from here. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me back. Thanks for your reflections. Um, I cannot believe that your family eats or, or drinks uh, or uses eight gallons of maple syrup a year. That That's is a lot of maple coffee. syrup. Uh, do you give it away as gifts or do you actually actually consume that much maple syrup we, in a we, year? <laughs> we, we do not consume that much syrup. So it makes a beautiful <laughs> gift. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. So it's better than anything I could uh, 
could could give in any other way. So, well, I was I was struck by uh, also by your uh, the the that idea that um, that nature brings us back to silence, and that sometimes if we're not connected to nature, we don't miss it. But when we connect, uh, we realize that. And I I had a, a coworker make fun of me because I had a habit of parking. Um, far away from the office and walking across the lawn yeah. under under these giant oak trees every morning yeah. because I started to realize that we had these beautiful this is like all summer we'd have beautiful summer days and and beautiful uh beautiful days but I would just sit in my office all day and I would never be able to go outside so what I do is I would just take my time walking into work and I'd walk under these giant oak trees and you know, notice birds and squirrels, and just yeah. you know, and just walk, you know, you know, get some mud on my shoes, perhaps. But that yeah. idea of that, and so I would just say, "Hey, stop making fun of me." That's the only connection I have to nature during the week is yeah. walking under these trees because my job is so busy and all. You know what I mean? I just I don't have a moment to breathe, and yep. so there was something about just walking, uh, you know, just walking across. We have a huge lawn with these giant oak trees, and so there was something about walking under that, and then. I was in charge of, um, for years, uh, the HR department's in charge of it now, but for years when I started at the diocese 12 years ago, it was my job to like organize the social events. So I, when we did our, um, uh, we did our, uh, our staff appreciation, I would always set tables. You know, it, it was a pain in the neck because I had to get to convince people to move tables with me, but we'd move all the tables under these giant oak trees. Oh, beautiful. And it was enough shade for us to be able to have the whole lunch outside in the 90 degree heat of California, yeah. right? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, do tables and chairs ministry together to bring it out. And then we would have our whole thing uh, out under those trees. And I used to just think how great this was. And the, the pinnacle of it was when I got the bishop to karaoke with a group of people underneath the oak trees uh, outside. Uh, it was beautiful, but but that idea, but I, but I remember, but, but you, you, you reminded me of that. Um, I, I'm blessed to have a decent sized backyard uh, in our neighborhood, which is kind of rare in California, but our, but our backyard is fairly large and has some older trees compared mm. to the rest of the neighborhood. So we're kind of a bird sanctuary mm. uh, out in our backyard. So this last year, my uh, nest fell out of a tree with two babies that were like almost ready to leave the nest, but not quite. Mm. And so my wife panicked and, you know, called, the, you know, and so we, we had to make sure we didn't mow too close to it. And uh, these baby birds were like just, you know, they weren't flying yet, but they were, you know, all over the yard, uh, you know, for like three or four days. And I just, um, uh, we had a great time with my family, just kind of watching these birds and, you know, making sure that we didn't want to touch them or, or whatever. We were just like, let's just see, you know, let's just make sure they, they do okay. And they, and they actually eventually flew away and we saw them, you know, fly away, but we, we got to like observe them, uh, yeah. you know, in the, in the yard. And I just, um, my wife got really, you know, motherly, like she was so worried about these birds, like she'd get up really early and like, make sure they were still alive and, yeah. you know, and, and look for them at night, you know, when it got dark, where are they, where, you know, are they warm enough or whatever, right? And I was just like, you know, again, we probably had a hundred bird, baby birds grow up in our backyard in the, you know, six years we've been here, but we never, you know, made a connection, except because yeah. of COVID, we're all home all day yeah. long, right? And what else do you do, right? So it's led us to that. Um, also, just, uh, we have like a, you know, it's a, it's just a propane fire pit thing. So, mm -hmm. so I've been trying to get the family outside in the evening um, to, to pray around the campfire, right? So I have to do s'mores to get them all to come out. And then I hit <laughs> hey, them with the prayer. If, right? if food you is know? what it takes. But, That's right. you know, so I get, I get them outside for the s'mores and then I hit them with the prayer. So uh, we've been uh, doing <laughs> I, that. I'm, I'm really thing. glad you brought up the bird feeder though, Deacon, because I think that is a simple $20. Uh, that's a ton of entertainment, especially for young kids. Um, my, we have the bird book there uh, and you know, that's right. We can watch, uh, we, right as we're eating dinner, we can sit and watch and see who else comes to dinner. It's always great conversation and uh, the kids love it. They love the name and which birds are there and, and to, uh, it really, it, it gives them that chance to, yeah, kind of tune in and, and uh, observe, so. Well, I'm just amazed at how many, you know, my wife is, is, is scared that I'm going to become a bird watcher, but I'm just amazed at how many different kinds of birds come through our yard, right? I mean, it's just, I never noticed before, right? Because I, 
you know, I come home from work late and, and we just have dinner and then it's dark and whatever. So being able to be home. And then when I, you know, so I've just, I've, I've been trying to do that. That's just be, the other thing we have in our area is a lot of turkeys. Like uh, this area is like overrun by turkeys because they don't have any awesome. natural habitats So these wild turkeys. And in, in the where area I live is called Roseville and they have a lot of open space areas that they've designated. So it's, you know, it's like urban sprawl, like suburban, you know, building, they're building, I think 10,000 homes in our area, but there's uh -huh. like, they designate a certain number of acres in, in every hundred acres that has to be open space. So in between all these housing developments or these open space areas that are just kind of like wild, right? And, but what grows there mostly is turkey. So you'll have, you know, so we have this one street that's not developed on one side because it's open space and there's just like families of right now, all the baby turkeys are being born. And so there's like families of turkeys, like walk, you know, going across the street. I'm like scared to death. I'm going to hit one uh, because every single time I go down, you know, it's a, it's a long way and you tend to, you know, go a little fast. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, you know, six or seven turkeys trying to cross the street. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but my uh, daughters have been watching uh, some of these turkeys and, you know, like, Oh, I, you know, that's, you know, that's the same, you know, same family of turkeys. They're, they're like watching these family of turkeys and they, and they get yeah. connected to it. And, and I think that your point about the beauty of nature um, is, uh, is so important um, that, that, that nature is uh, beautiful and reveals the beauty of God to us. Um, and often we just drive through it, you know what I mean? Or we just don't notice it or, or we see it as um, we see it as something that that you know that's that's a hassle or scary or whatever. Yeah. But that idea of um, you know intentionally spending time in nature as prayer, mm -hmm. or you know it's not it doesn't have to be for, you know, prayer in the in like because people think prayer and they think I have to say the Our Father and three Hail Marys. Right, that's right. not really what I'm saying. I'm saying that spending that moment of quiet in nature is by by it by definition prayer because mm -hmm. we are experiencing the beauty of god in that in a way that uh that's that's unique that's unique to you in that situation at that moment in that time mm -hmm. um you know you talked about sunsets right so we always think about sunsets but there's just the the, the and, and you talked about silence i thought that you know it's beauty but there's a lot of things that that we can really um discover uh, if we just take the time to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the real challenge. It's really just, like I said, it's that inertia. It's that just, it's the removing of all the other distractions in our life. And that's, that's not easy, you know? Um, but I, I can tell you that um, I took a group of high school students, 10th through 12th graders uh, on a week long kayaking trip to the Apostle Islands, which is up uh, on Lake Superior. And it was such a beautiful thing to drive north. And as you could start to see the trees change and move into this kind of evergreen, um, you know, motif, if you will, uh, they just kind of, you, you could visible, visibly see them just relax and they, they knew their phones didn't work. And I know people seem, think this is, they don't believe it when I say that these, these high schoolers were really happy to be away from their phones for a week. You know, I think he wants you, once you get past that idea of, oh, I couldn't live without my phone for a week, it's a beautiful thing. And um, they, they just, you know, and this is of course coupled with time on Lake Superior, you know, with your feet in the sand and skipping rocks and watching all the sunsets and all that. But, um, but coupled with removing that distraction uh, is a beautiful thing. How do you convince uh, teens who want to be connected constantly to social media or their screens or whatever, how, how do you convince them to disconnect uh, and just be in nature or to just go outside? What, what's your uh, advice to parents that maybe are struggling with that? I think you have to, I think you just have to stay strong, you know, and <laughs> it, because as you know, there's a push there. There's going to be that initial resistance. And, and I think the tendency for us as parents is to say, oh, this is so much work just to, just to make the, the convince, you know, just to get them. But once you can get them to that place, I honestly don't think, I think that then the rest, the rest of it will take care of itself. Um, but I, I think you just have to push through that initial pushback uh, that your kids will inevitably give you. And they'll give you that from, a, from an early age, you know. Um, 
And we, we have this conversation with my kids all the time after they've put up a fight about something. And I said, when was the last time I made you do something, you know, that was unenjoyable, you know? And so just to remind them that, look, I want to give you good experiences. And I think to convince them of that, uh, and then just know that, okay, this is going to be a fight, but we're going to get there. We're going to get outside and, and everyone's going to have a great time. Yeah. I mean, I, I think sometimes the gift of this COVID crisis for some families, right? Some some people are really, really struggling with the disease and with um, lack of work. And But for many of the families um, that, that I'm connected with, um, this has been a time of slowing down. They can't do 900 activities a week or whatever. So not ha- you know not being able to go out to their you know their usual restaurants or their usual routine so knocking us out of our usual routine another speaker we had uh, on another on our uh, on, on our young adult retreat was saying you know do you realize that god just stopped the world to spend time with you yeah. and so i've been thinking a lot about that that idea that um you know me as a deacon and, a, and as a dad and, and 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 having this big job at the you know having a having a, a, a very uh, busy job um, getting just more space, even just not having to commute, right? And just, and, mm-hmm. you know, and being able to take a break in my backyard and, be, you know, whatever, that this is a, that this slowing down. So, and that's what I've always associated outside uh, with. Um, when we used to go camping with my family, I, I was amazed that we weren't bored. Mm. <laughs> Yep. We had nothing to do. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like, like we would go and go like, what are we going to do? Right. So I would like throw every board game in the flipping house in my car. Right. Thinking like, I'm just going to be bored. Right. I try to yep. sneak in my little, I, I had those Mattel electronics, little electronic games and stuff. I try to throw those into. And so, and so my, my dad would be like, why did you bring so many games? Cause I was worried uh, that I would be bored, but there was something about it. The, the pace was slowed down and, um, I wasn't bored. And what I love about that cre- creation meditation at the beginning was that, you know, he just refers to us all as children. And I think that, that, you know, especially the camping trip, that turns us all back into kids, right? And, you know, we went camping with my kids last fall and um, we, you know, birch bark trees are amazing because the birch bark will stay solid, but the inside of the tree will just rot out. And so you can take the inside out. And my kids were putting the birch bark over their head and they cut some eyes and those, you know, and made some birch bark masks, and then they were just having these huge acorn wars with each other, you know. Uh, it's just time to just good, clean, homemade, creative fun, and I think that that's, that's another thing that the outside encourages us to do, you know, so yeah, chuck acorns at each other. It's good time. <laughs> you can, you, that's yeah. what you should do with your coworker is just gather some of those acorns as you walk under the oaks, and then, you know, kind of, Throw, throw, throw it at them. Yeah. Lob them, sure. And we also have a, so we have an interesting situation at Diocese of Sacramento because we actually have a lot of open space, but the back is all a cemetery. So behind is a huge oh. cemetery and the front has, there. there's just a, there's some open space there with trees and, and everything. So uh, there's some people that always eat lunch in the cemetery, which I always thought was kind of, but it's, you know, it's, it's a natural, it is a natural uh, habitat as well. There's a whole area there that's, um, that's, uh, it's an older cemetery. So it is, it's, it's kind of, parts of it are like kind of wild and overgrown and, that, and, and that's where the benches are. So there's people sitting out there just, you know, kind of, you know, just whatever, just taking their break out there in nature. It's, it, it is nice. And, we also have a beautiful area in the middle that nobody uses. It's got a Mary statue and some benches. It's like a, like an, like a, like a, it's like an open space in the middle of the building uh, that they made. So there's, there's trees and everything growing. It's open to the, 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 to the sky, uh, but it's, it's just right in the middle of the building. And, and so there's, it, it's, it's kind of a windowed area. Um, I guess people don't want people to walk by and walk, look at them, but it's funny how nobody, I mean, almost somebody was sitting in there having lunch the other day and I'm like, wow, like that actually looks like a really nice place to have lunch. I wonder how much <laughs> nobody ever goes out there. Like the only time we ever go out there is to, is to uh, crown the Mary statue on the f- 1st of May, but the wow. rest of the year, no one ever goes out into that area. Yeah. You know, when I was talking about lessons that we can learn from nature too, and when you talk about the cemetery, it just reminds me too of, I think, you know, the Paschal mystery for us as Catholics is so hard to understand how does this new life come from death. But I think that the forest, you know, does that so well too. And, um, you know, when you look at this decaying log that's, you know, 
becoming new dirt and out of it is growing new things. And I, I just think that um, to be able to watch that actually happen. Uh, and I love showing that to kids, you know, to show them that what we call nurse logs, you know, this, this decaying log that's growing all sorts of ferns and um, just new life out of death. And I think that that in this time right now, you know, of, of COVID and the things that have been, been laid to rest for a while, you know, what, but what is the new life that's going to come out of, out of all this? I think that nature can help us, uh, you know, kind of grasp that and understand that. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I think the first experience I had with dead animals was in Boy Scouts uh, camping, you know, um, I forget what it was. It was, you know, it, but, but it was like when I learned about turkey vultures, right? Because we, <laughs> we had some dead, some, some kind of a dead, dead animal. I think it was a rabbit or something like that. And, and these turkey vultures came down and we happened to be hiking and we just watched these turkey vultures tear apart this dead a rabbit right and uh and it was it was terrifying and fascinating at the same time um but it was also um you know i remember uh, reading uh, extensively i was a big reader back then and i i read extensively about the turkey vulture and everything about it and um and then in california there's a lot of turkey vultures if you're in the open space in northern california you just always see turkey vultures and i thought they were always golden eagles but they were turkey <laughs> vultures right? they just look they have such a large wingspan and they just they just soar right they're just beautiful right so to me that became really a symbol of god for me as a child mm -hmm. and um when i when i learned to play guitar in junior high one of the first songs i wrote was about the turkey vulture uh, wow. being a symbol of god uh, because everywhere i went when i was at, alone in nature mm -hmm. i would this turkey vulture uh, i'd always see a turkey vulture soar by and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily my introduction of the turkey vulture was not as a beautiful thing. It was tearing apart this rabbit carcass. Sure. But then it was like the beauty of it soaring and, um, you know, just just those things. And I think a lot of us um, have uh, experiences like that or connections to nature. It's a natural connection that we make um, because of the beauty of that. And 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 I I think that the 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 Pope's um, uh, the Pope Laudato Si and the Pope's, um, you know, uh, call for us to really take care of nature and nurture it and be good stewards of nature. And you know, I loved your story about the about the about the the people you spent time with that used everything, right? They didn't wow. they didn't waste. You know, we always did that. I remember that's one of the things I remember when I worked at a summer camp. We would always like weigh the waste and try to get the waste down, of right? Because it would be exactly. the first day. It would be like. A ridiculous amount of, of waste right and so by the end of the week we could always get it down to you know to like a tenth it was always like one tenth of what they wasted the first day on, on the last day and our and, kids know. our kids will tell us that that is one of the most i think impactful experiences at camp is to weigh we call it ort ort is a small morsel of food so yep so we weigh everything we scrape everything off their plates and i think yeah to see it go from seven or eight pounds to you know, to zero or on that last day, it's amazing. And it's amazing to see what we, what we do waste. So, um, yeah. And in, in that little village, they would build this, this, cause they didn't have a lot of wood. So they, they had a little clay pot and they would build just a little fire in there with twigs to warm up this, um, this kind of broth that they would feed the, um, the water buffalo. And she'd use a little reed to blow on it and just keep this little fire going. You know, she didn't build this big massive fire. She built as just what she needed, mm -hmm. just enough to do the job. And it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I want to really thank you uh, for your, uh, for your uh, reflection today and for being with us and thank you for your ministry. Um, you know, we've been, um, we, we've had a, we've had a, a camp here in the diocese of Sacramento for 60 years now, Camp Pendola. And um, our, our director, Jennifer Campbell, uh, arranged for you to be here with us. I know she met you through some uh, camp, uh, camp uh, conferences and things yeah. like that. Uh, a retreat, I guess a retreat that they do with camp directors, which is great. And uh, uh, just to let people know, we, we, you know, we, we have uh, next week, we're doing our uh, last week of virtual camp, uh, virtual camp Pendola. Um, we try to do everything that you do at camp. So they they send you a box with all the materials there. They do the overnight, they, they do the campfire, they do a lot of different things. So it's an attempt to try to keep people connected uh, to our camp programs. And um, uh, so just wanted to let you know about that. And I have some announcements. Our, our, uh, 
our Zoom meeting is is uh, in a very weird state. We're still live on uh, on uh, YouTube, but we can't share our screen or use any of the other controls of Zoom. So I have some announcements because it wouldn't be a Catholic uh, event without announcements. <laughs> um, so that virtual camp is July 26th through 31st, and it's called Mission Possible Week. That's the theme because uh, we always have a, a you always have to have a theme uh, for your camp week. Um, and then um, what else? Um, we also um, have a young adult retreat that's happening all through Ordinary Time. It's called Extraordinary Times. And uh, every other Thursday at 9 p.m., we have a speaker and a reflection and a time just to connect. So you can put your kids to bed, get done with whatever you're doing in the day, and then just tune in for an hour at 9 o'clock on Thursday night. So our next one is this Thursday, July 23rd. Um, and our speaker this week is uh, uh, Lynn, is Lynn Solano at nine o'clock. And then um, virtual camp. That's okay. So those are my only two announcements. Um, we've been uh, closing every uh, session um, of this uh, past this past month uh, with a prayer from our Black Catholic Ministry, uh, uh, which is also part of our department. And um, they wrote this prayer for unity, and we've been trying to pray this together. So let's pray this together to end our session and. Thanks again, Jeff, uh, for your time. And we certainly will have you uh, you back. You have some good stories and some really good connections and reflections for us. And we appreciate, uh, especially the practical suggestions. Um, I felt affirmed by the things that you said and um, kind of excited to try to uh, push my daughters into the backyard at least a little bit more. <laughs> awesome. Uh, maybe fight a little bit more for the camping trip I've been wanting to do all summer. So there you go, stay we'll strong. How, yeah, we do that, we'll stay strong. So anyway. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh God, at the dawn of creation, you ordered the world out of chaos. You breathe life into all humankind, creating us in your image and likeness. You, Father, who are almighty, all-loving, all-powerful, have entrusted to us the bounty of your love. We pray that you be patient with us as we endeavor to do your holy will. You sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, into the world as an example of your love so that we might, through your goodness, be strengthened as your holy people. Give us the courage that we might work to bring forth a world united in justice, reconciliation, and solidarity. Come, Holy Spirit, open our hearts and enlighten our minds. Help us to replace hatred with love, mistrust with understanding, indifference with tolerance, so that we may become peacemakers. May your kingdom of justice, peace, and love reign over people of every race, culture and nation, that your glory may be revealed in the hearts of all. And we pray in a special way tonight for all parents, especially those that are struggling in whatever way, that you might be with them, Lord, and that we, we pray for the protection of our Blessed Mother Mary as well, um, our parent, all of our parents. And we pray uh, that our Father God will be with us. Lord, you be with us, uh, comfort us, help us to stay strong, and help us to continue to see the beauty of your creation. We ask all this in your loving name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Much.